Hello there, listeners. It's Susie New from the Australian Society of Anaesthetists, and welcome to our podcast. It's called Australian Anaesthesia, and it's where we talk about all things relevant to anaesthesia in Australia. In this episode, I'm going to be going through mandibular or jaw dislocation as it occurs in relation to anaesthesia. The information in this podcast is based on cases reported to the WebAirs database. If you haven't heard about WebAirs, it's spelt Web, W-E-B-A-I-R-S, and the A-I-R-S stands for Anesthesia Incident Reporting System. It was developed in 2009, and the Australian Society of Anesis is proud to support it. If you want to know more about the WebAirs database, then please go back and listen to episode 54 of this podcast, that's 5-4, where I chat with Professor Martin Culwick, the medical director of WebAirs, and someone who was very instrumental to its development. The content in this episode is based on a paper that was written by Dr. Chris Acott and the ANSIDAC case report writing group. Huge, huge thank you to Dr. Acott and the ANSIDAC committee for letting me produce this content into our podcast, which hopefully you will find useful and relevant to your practice. And you can find that article on the WebEdge webpage, which of course I'll put a link to in the show notes. Okay, as I said, I'm going to be talking about mandibular or jaw dislocation. I'm going to be going through how common it is, the anatomy of the temporomandibular joint, the pathophysiology, particularly the factors related to anesthesia, as we've discovered in the WebAirs database, the signs and symptoms, the management, and then finally some recommendations from the WebAirs reports. So in terms of prevalence, jaw dislocation is reported to be rare in the general population, but not an uncommon complication of general anesthesia or airway manipulation. In terms of the WebAirs database, there were 18, one eight incidents identified out of now about 10,000 cases in the database. Of those 10,000, about 3,500 were airway incidents. So it does account for a very small number of airway incidents, about half a percent of those reported to the reporting system. Of course, you've got to be mindful there of the denominator. It's not half a percent of all anaesthetics. It's just half a percent of those that were reported to us. So just by comparison, there was another report that was published on wrong blood in tube events. So that's where a patient's blood sample may have been mislabeled. And of about 10,000 reports in the WebAirs database, only four were related to wrong blood in tube events. And I suspect that that is a far more common event. So that just shows you the impact of reporting bias. Okay, so back to jaw dislocation. The incidents reported to Webers occurred during anesthesia for gastroscopy, colonoscopy, LMA insertion, and yawning on induction. In the medical literature, jaw dislocation has also been reported with laryngoscopy and intubation. However, overall, the exact prevalence of temporomandibular joint dislocation or mandibular dislocation following laryngoscopy is not known. Thankfully, serious complications of temporomandibular joint, I'm going to say TMJ from now on, Thankfully, serious complications of TMJ dislocation are rare. Okay, so let's talk through some anatomy. The TMJ, the temporomandibular joint, is an articulation. It's the joint between the mandible and the temporal bone of the skull, and it consists of the mandibular condyle, so that's the bit that sticks out of the mandible, and the glenoid fossa, so that's the cup, that's the socket, if you like, in the temporal bone. There's an intra-articular disc that sits between these two bones. And the mechanics of the TMJ is that it's under control of the muscles of mastication. So these are the muscles of chewing, the masseter, medial and lateral pterygoids, and the temporalis muscle. And there's also some ligaments there to stabilize the joint, the stylomandibular, sphenomandibular, and the pterygomandibular ligaments. Control of TMJ movement is done by the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve via the masseteric and oricotemporal nerves. Blood supply to the joint is via the superficial temporal branch of the external carotid artery. The normal movements of the TMJ are rotational. So rotational is opening and closing the jaw, like when we talk and eat, and translational. So translational movements basically mean sliding movements. So there's that protrusion retraction that you might be doing, that forward-backward motion that you might be doing when you're assessing someone's airway. And there's also lateral translational movements. So that's when the jaw moves from left to right. Okay, in terms of the pathophysiology, dislocation occurs when the mandibular condylar head moves out of the glenoid fossa and it can't move back into its normal position within the fossa. So the dislocation can be either unilateral, one-sided, bilateral, affecting both sides. It can be partial, what's known as a subluxation, or it can be complete dislocation where that head comes completely out of the fossa. There is no age or gender predilection. 
It most commonly occurs in an anterior direction, so the mandibular condyle becomes anterior of the glenoid fossa. That's important to remember as it guides you as to how to reduce the dislocation. So saying that again, the most common dislocation is when the head of the mandible sits anterior of the glenoid fossa. Jaw dislocation can occur spontaneously, and you may have already met a patient who has that history, or it can occur in association with airway manipulation. Recurrent dislocation may occur in people with connective tissue disorders such as Ehlers-Danlos, Marfan's, and people with orofacial dystonia. So in terms of pathophysiology, what were the things that were associated with TMJ dislocation in the WebS database? The big take home, I think, there is that a past history of jaw clicking or dislocation of the mandible was one of the most common features in the cases. This was noted in five of the 18 cases reported to WebEyes. And that is something we can assess for. In four of those five cases, the past history of TMJ dislocation was actually obtained after the event. And in the remaining incidents, TMJ function was not asked about during the pre-anesthesia consult. So the big takeaway for me there is to do a thorough airway assessment, as you always would. And also include in that assessment asking whether there's any pain in the jaw or any clicking when you're assessing jaw movements. So that jaw protrusion or that forward translocation movement. And since preparing this podcast, I have actually been doing that. And wouldn't you believe it, but on the first day that I did it, I did have a patient who revealed to me at the time that they did experience clicking in the jaw quite routinely. And that then led me to have a good discussion about the risk of dislocation and what it might look or feel like. And it just so happened that I was in recovery when their LMA was removed. And the first thing they said to me was, my jaw feels fine. So I also really appreciated the patient knowing about it and being able to immediately exclude that they had a jaw dislocation. Jaw dislocation can occur after any, I repeat, any airway manipulation, whether it's forceful or not. So what was found in the WebS database was that forceful jaw thrust was associated with jaw dislocation, but also careful, gentle airway manipulation was associated with jaw dislocation, particularly in people who'd had a prior history of dislocation or of a clicking jaw, which is slightly disconcerting because it would be nice to be able to reassure our patients who had that past history that we could do things that could prevent the jaw from dislocating. Interestingly, though so what was found in the WebEyes database was that no incident was associated with the management of a difficult airway. I so said to say that another way, all the incidents that were reported were following the management of a straightforward airway or a non-difficult airway, however that might be defined. Another factor that was associated with jaw dislocation was yawning at induction. Many of you might have noticed that yawning at induction is common, and it's actually a bit surprising that dislocation of the TMJ is not seen more frequently. It's thought that yawning can cause dislocation because the ligaments around the joint are relaxed, and then that allows the condyle to move anteriorly. Yawning on induction, that's something you can't really prevent, I don't think. There were no patient demographic features like age or gender that were seen as contributing factors in the WebS database, and that also mirrors what has been described in the literature. The majority of jaw dislocations were diagnosed in recovery or the post-anesthetic care unit, PACU, or in the hospital ward and not actually by the anesthetist at the time. So it's important to know what the signs and symptoms are because you might be consulted about this after the event. So the things to look for are discomfort. If it's on one side, then it's likely to indicate unilateral dislocation. Of course, as I mentioned, it could be bilateral. If it's severe pain, then that might mean that there's been an associated mandibular fracture and that's really important because that will change your management in that we shouldn't try to reduce a dislocation and you would consider an x-ray first to exclude a fracture. The other thing to ask about is there might be an inability to close or open the mouth. There may be speech difficulty. The patient might be drooling. And on examination, the mandible may be locked in a forward position. And if you palpate the TMJ space, you'll feel that it's empty and painful to palpation. So if you suspect someone has a mandibular dislocation, what are you going to do about it? Well, interestingly, of the 18 reports to WebEyes, only one dislocation was successfully reduced by the anaesthetist. The rest were reduced by the surgeons or by other medical specialists. So in terms of management, the first thing you need to do is to make sure that the patient is safe. So it depends at which stage you've diagnosed the jaw dislocation. If it's something that's diagnosed in recovery, then hopefully you've got them through the anaesthetic and into recovery safely and there hasn't been an issue with oxygenation. 
But if you notice that jaw dislocation occurs during induction, then that could potentially make further airway management difficult. So we need to ensure that we are delivering oxygen and that the patient is not going to become hypoxic. Because the jaw dislocation may have resulted in the jaw being in a fixed open position, that might mean that our initial plan for airway management is not going to be successful. If you're planning to intubate the patient, you may not be able to go ahead and perform laryngoscopy because the jaw is fixed. In that case, you may continue to maintain anesthesia and then attempt oxygenation with a supraglottic device. In this case, a rigid supraglottic device, like the curved second generation supraglottic devices, might be difficult to use because of the difficulty in passing a rigid device through such limited mouth opening. And if you're finding that the case, then the recommendation here is to use a classic laryngeal mask airway. And then you need to get on and reduce the dislocation. In fact, recall I said earlier that if the patient is in severe pain, this might indicate that they have a mandibular fracture. And in that case, you wouldn't try to reduce the dislocation. You'd first of all try to diagnose the fracture, and that might require an x-ray and then referral to a specialist for ongoing management, particularly open surgical intervention. But if you're confident that the patient doesn't have a mandibular fracture, then you should get on and reduce the dislocation as soon as possible because ongoing dislocation can lead to prolonged spasm of the muscles and prolonged spasm can make surgical intervention more likely. So now assuming that the patient is safe and they don't have a fracture, let's talk reduction of the dislocation. Remember I said that most dislocations occur anteriorly, which also fits with the direction of movement that we're doing with jaw thrust and other airway manipulations. Well, the traditional method of reducing an anterior dislocation was first described by Hippocrates, and it's called the bimanual method, and that's what I'm going to go through now. In this, the patient is sitting. The person who is going to reduce the dislocation is facing the patient and wearing gloves. The operator or the proceduralist would get some gauze around their thumb to prevent any biting-related trauma, and then puts their gloved, wrapped thumbs inside the patient's mouth on the posterior molar teeth of the mandible and they push the teeth downwards while the outside fingers are grasping the lower edge of the anterior mandible and are lifting upwards. Let me try and describe that again. Okay, so if you're the operator, you've got some gloves on, you have wrapped your thumbs with gauze to prevent any biting related trauma. You place your thumbs on the posterior molar teeth of the mandible so the lower molars, and are pushing those molars downwards while your other fingers are grasping the lower edge of the anterior mandible. So you're kind of holding a bit like a pistol grip, I imagine. You might also use your other fingers under the chin or under the anterior mandible to help tip the chin upwards. And the idea is that you're trying to get the condyle of the mandible down and posterior to that lip, to that anterior eminence of the glenoid fossa. You can tell I've never done this. Apparently, then once you're over that anterior eminence, then the muscles and the ligaments will help pull the condyle back into its correct place, into the correct alignment in the glenoid fossa, back into that socket. So the predominant movement is moving that mandibular condyle inferiorly and then letting the muscles and ligaments pull it back posteriorly. So you're pushing down. If it's proving to be a little bit difficult, then you can inject local anesthetic into the muscles and that might help. And you may also consider giving some additional sedation. If it's irreducible, then that might indicate that there is some soft tissue sitting between the condyle and the glenoid fossa. And in that case, that would require an open surgical reduction. So you may need to be getting a second opinion on this. If you notice the dislocation has occurred due to jaw thrust or during laryngoscopy, then you might consider in continuing anesthesia and relocating the jaw while the patient is still anesthetized. If you're going to do this, remember, as I said at the start, the first priority is to maintain oxygenation. Make sure the patient is safe before you get focused on the task of reducing the mandible. So make sure they're safe, make sure they're oxygenated, continue anesthesia in a safe way. I want to add a really big disclaimer here. Just because you've heard me describe how to reduce an anteriorly dislocated mandible doesn't mean I'm telling you that you should do it. You have to make that decision on the day in that situation. It will, of course, depend on where you are and what resources are around you, your previous skills and experience, and what is going on with the anesthetic with the patient. So remember, just because you heard it on a podcast or read about it on the internet doesn't mean you automatically should go ahead and do it. You need to make that decision on a case-by-case basis.
Apparently, the emergency physicians do this all the time. It would vary, I think, geographically where you are in Australia, if that is the case. But a very lovely MaxFact surgeon that I was working with recently said that emergency physicians do this really commonly. So if you are in a hospital with an emergency department, you might consider asking one of your colleagues, come and assist. And of course, your other point of call is to contact your local friendly MaxFact surgeon. There have been other methods described in terms of relocating dislocated jaws. There's ones where you stand behind the patient. There's ones with different positioning of your hands. So don't be surprised if your friendly emergency physician or MaxFact surgeon comes and does a different technique. I've described the one that's in the article. And as a guess, probably the most common technique, but don't quote me on that. I'm not an expert. I'm just taking a guess on that one. Occasionally, the joint can re-dislocate. So in that case, you might consider applying a Barton bandage. Now, that's an interesting looking bandage. I'll try and put a link to it in the show notes. It's like a figure of eight bandage and it's wrapped around the head and the jaw to provide support below and anterior to the mandible. So there's a little strap that comes under the chin and there's a strap that comes in front of the chin and they kind of crisscross at the occiput and also at the crown of the head. The other thing that you might try and advise is the patient avoid opening their mouth wide for at least six weeks. And if they anticipate a yawn, thankfully you do get a bit of warning before you yawn, then the patient should place a fist under their chin to prevent wide mouth opening. Part of avoiding opening the mouth too wide is to encourage the patient to cut their food into small pieces. And if this is an ongoing chronic problem, then the patient might need to consult with an oro and maxillofacial surgeon to look at tightening the ligaments around the temporomandibular joint or other surgical interventions. Okay, so that's management. Okay, there are three main takeaways from the WebAir's report and this podcast. The first one is that jaw dislocation is not rare and therefore we as anaesthetists should be aware of the problem and be prepared for how we might manage it, both immediately and in terms of reducing the dislocation. As I said before, make sure the patient is safe, make sure they're getting oxygen, You might need to change your airway management plan and go to a rescue device. And the recommended rescue device there is a classic laryngeal mask airway, classic LMA. The more rigid LMAs, the more rigid second generation superglottic devices may not fit into the patient's mouth when their jaw is stuck. So an important part of this takeaway is the recommendation from WebAirs that every theatre should have a classic LMA in it as a rescue device. Another recommendation from WebAirs is that anaesthetists should know at least one method to reduce a dislocated mandible. And I described that method before. Apparently, it's quite straightforward. You can tell I've never done it before, but apparently it is quite straightforward. There's also emergency physicians and oromaxillofacial surgeons that you could call upon for assistance or advice. The second take-home point is that unfortunately, in someone who does have a history of temporomandibular joint dislocation or jaw dislocation, Gentle airway management may not prevent dislocation. So WebAirs and I would recommend that TMJ function should be a part of your routine airway examination. You're already there assessing the malum patty, assessing their thyromental distance, assess their jaw translocation. And at that point, just ask, is there any pain or clicking when you do that? And that is exactly when it happened. My patient just said, funny you should mention that. I totally forgot my jaw clicks all the time. The other part of this take-home point is to reassess the patient in recovery. You've done a careful assessment preoperatively and so you should confirm that their jaw hasn't been dislocated in recovery and often we would do this inadvertently by talking with the patient and by asking them to eat and drink, depending, of course, on the surgery and the recovery. And the third and final take-home point is that if you do have a patient that does have a history of jaw dislocation, particularly recurrent jaw dislocation, then consider referring them for investigation to exclude other causes that could contribute to that. And we're talking pretty significant conditions such as myotonia, muscular dystrophies, Parkinson's disease, and multiple sclerosis. And it's also important to let the patient know that it's really important to tell their anaesthetist about their past history of jaw dislocation if they require anesthesia in the future. Okay, so in summary, I hope you have a better understanding of jaw dislocation now as it occurs with anesthesia and understand that it's not a rare complication of upper airway manipulation. Therefore, we as anesthetists should be aware of this problem and how we might manage it in the immediate setting. The first thing always, if you do suspect it has occurred, is to ensure that the patient is receiving adequate oxygenation. Exclude fracture. 
and then to attempt reduction as soon as possible. I hope you have a better understanding of the anatomy and how the mandibular condyle sits in the glenoid fossa and how dislocations tend to occur with the condylar head coming anterior of the glenoid. And hopefully that also helps guide your management in terms of reducing the dislocation. I hope you're aware of some of the factors in terms of the pathophysiology, particularly a past history of jaw dislocation or some of those connective tissue disorders. And you know how to screen for these during your anaesthetic assessment. I hope you found that tip about assessing a patient's temporomandibular joint function useful and something that you might be able to incorporate into your routine pre-anaesthetic airway assessment. If you do something else, then feel free to let me know. Or if you have some different views, again, keen to hear what they are. The best way to contact me is via email, and that email address is podcast at asa.org.au. Of course, I'll leave a link for it in the show notes. If you've enjoyed this podcast episode from the WebAir's library, then please feel free to listen to episode 57, that's 5-7, of the Australian Anesthesia podcast, where I discuss lingual nerve injury as it relates to anesthesia. There's a really interesting link in the show notes of that podcast. So that's episode 5-7 of the Australian Anesthesia podcast, another update from WebAir's on lingual nerve injury. And don't forget to follow or subscribe to this podcast because there are more updates from WebAirs in the pipeline. And I also encourage you that if you have any incidents, which I sincerely hope that you don't, that you also consider reporting them to us via WebAirs. And as I mentioned at the start, more details can be found in episode 54 of this podcast, the Australian Anesthesia Podcast. And of course, I'll put a link to that episode and a link to WebAirs in the show notes. Okay, until next time, I hope you and your patients are staying safe and well out there. Thank you for listening to the Australian Anesthesia Podcast, which can be found on all the major podcast hosting platforms, as well as YouTube. This podcast is produced by the Australian Society of Anaesthetists and hosted by Dr. Susie New with music created by Dr. Mark Seuss. The ASA was formed in 1934, and our vision is for every anaesthetist in Australia to be at their best, providing the highest quality anaesthesia and perioperative care through excellent technical and non-technical skills. We also hope that this means that you are functioning at your best when you're away from work. In this podcast, we have conversations that seek to inform, challenge, and inspire you to keep you performing at your best. Members of the ASA can access full versions of all episodes by logging into the ASA website at asa.org.au. If you are listening on your favorite podcast app, then make sure you look at the episode notes for the direct link to the podcast on the ASA website. Also, feel free to follow or subscribe so that you can receive the latest episodes as we do publish regularly. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to email us on podcast at asa.org.au. Thank you for your time and we hope you enjoyed listening.